So when I asked Abby and I picked him up at the airport in Calgary yesterday about his, you know, his intro, he said, please God, just don't read my bio. I said, okay, I never do that anyways because you can all read, you've all read his bio, right? But I just want to say my experiences with Abby over the last number of years, and they go way back uh, for many things. I first met his wife actually when I was executive director at the Parkland Institute. Some of you may have heard of that. August organization, yeah. also a sponsor, also a uh, great partner of uh, us here. We brought uh, this journalist in called Naomi Klein. She had written this new book. And actually, I don't know if any of you know this, but Naomi's first time holding, the, they shipped a box of books to Edmonton just hot off the presses, and she opened the box at our office wow. and pulled out her first copy of the wow. logo <laughs> with me there, right? So cool. Yeah. It was just before Seattle. That's a whole other story I won't go into. <laughs> Keep that one quiet. Uh, but um, yeah, so that's where we started crossing paths. Abby was uh, running a program called Counterspin, a national current affairs program. So the first time I actually met Abby was he invited me to a, uh, the 2001, March 2001 election was going on at the time. And so we did a live show nationally uh, out of the University of Calgary. And I had to debate who was that again? Who was this woman, this crazy woman? Yeah, who was that? Oh, yeah, Danielle Smith. It was fun. We had, uh, you can say whether I did okay. It was fun. Abby uh, and I uh, share a passion for documentary filmmaking. We drove all the way up from. Calgary today, being total geeks, talking about filmmaking and all those weird things. And so he's made a couple of great documentary films. And in particular, he's going to talk tonight about his latest four-year project. This is, by the way, the first time he's given a speech in the last four years. Four years. Because as a documentary filmmaker, he's been obsessed with this latest project, which is based on his wife's book, This Changes Everything. So he is here tonight to inspire us, as Albertans, to change everything here in Alberta. Please welcome Abby Lewis. Hello everyone. How are you guys doing? Excellent. I'm so happy to be here. Um, Alberta, as we know, is a rich province. Richer, much richer for having Bill Moore Kilgannon. Yes. Yes. What, a, what a tremendous pleasure. What a tremendous organization this is. I, I spoke at a PIA conference uh, seven years ago, and, uh, and I'm just thrilled by what Public Interest Alberta has, has managed to do. I, um, I, I'm glad that Bill started by acknowledging that we're on the lands of the Treaty 6 First Nations. Um, we're in a, an historic period of resurgent and inspiring Indigenous activism in Canada. Um, and it is, um, I think the, there's utility for us as settler people to remember, and one of the things about acknowledging whose land we're on is that it helps us remember that we're guests in this place. Um, and, and, and that's a good reminder that as humans we are guests on this planet. Um, and that taking better care of the place is not just a polite thing to do, it may also be a matter of collective survival. Um, but I'm not, let me not leap too quickly into the main theme. Got to do a little buttering up first, right? Um, I, I do want to start by saying how excited I am to be back in Alberta, and at what a time. <laughs> Here at the epicenter of the country's politics and economy, in a room full of frankly, beautiful, well-dressed progressives, the only kind, naturally, public sector champions in the first news cycle of an election campaign. My political DNA is just surging. Um, so if I, if at some point tonight I, I, I start pounding the podium and break into a stump speech and declare my candidacy, someone please restrain me, physically if necessary. I, uh, I've avoided it so far in life. It would be horrible to enter politics tonight. <laughs> um, I, uh, I do mean it when I say that Alberta is the epicenter of Canadian public life today. Um, 
as you all know, since the rise to power of a certain former denizen of the Imperial Oil Mailroom, <laughs> Alberta has become the very heart of the new Conservative Canada. And there is so much here, as you know, that is um, remarkable. <laughs> you are the richest province, we know that. You still have no sales tax, though I understand it was close. <laughs> you still have the lowest personal and corporate taxes in Canada. Yes. And you have some of the lowest royalty rates of any petro state anywhere. Yes. Yes. And not coincidentally, as you know, precisely because of those business pandering braggables I just mentioned, you have a whole slew of other Alberta superlatives. And they are shameful ones. This is how I suck up to the audience, right? <laughs> You've got the, just about the lowest child care spending in Canada. You've got the lowest participation rate in post-secondary education in Canada. You've got the lowest minimum wage in Canada. You've got the fastest growing economic inequality, income inequality in Canada. And according to one recent study, women in Alberta still make 60 cents on the male dollar in 2015. Shame! What the hell? Alberta. And then there is the small matter of greenhouse gas emissions, far and away the highest and fastest growing in the country. In fact, uh, just saw this study yesterday from, that just came out from Greenpeace and Environmental Defense. Um, and let me just read you the key quote at the end of the Globe and Mail story from yesterday's paper. Under Environment Canada's projections, which don't include new action by governments, and when we're talking about climate, anticipating no new action by the government of Canada, or governments in Canada, is a pretty safe bet, <laughs> with the exception of Ontario and Quebec. Alberta's emissions will be roughly equal to Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia combined in five years. Ooh. So you have one province with 11% of the population, driven by an industry that represents just 2% of our GDP, that will have levels of carbon pollution that are 93% of the emissions of the rest of the country. So, don't get me wrong, I come not to bury Alberta, but to radicalize you. And, wait, what was that sound? The sound of the intelligence operative in the room diving for the record button on his voice memo app. Dan, I, I, I know, I think, uh, hang on. Let me repeat this point so that no one misses it. I think Alberta is ripe for massive change. I think the odds are steep. I think the window is short, but I think the opportunity is real. I think, and I've come here tonight to tell you, that this province could be a leader in Canada in a grand transition that takes us so far from today's unjust and unsustainable status quo that it is nothing short of revolutionary. So there. I've said radical and revolution in the first three minutes of my talk. <laughs> so even if the CSIS guys got stuck in the tank working drive through line up and come in late, their software will flag it up when it goes online. And they'll get the full transcript. I, um, I, let, me, let, me, let me digress for a moment and tell you the story. I, uh, I, I took part as a subject in a reality TV show some years ago. Um, and I did so for a very specific reason which was that the producers agreed to let me look into my family history, in particular uh, the fact that the RCMP spied on my grandfather, David Lewis, for 55 years. In fact, they didn't close his file until some years after he was dead, which is a measure of the thoroughness, obviously, <laughs> services, if not their intelligence. Um, and so I got access to my grandpa's file as part of the show. And I went to the National Archive in Ottawa, and I went into this big, ornate, red velvet room and they made me put on lovely white cotton gloves and they brought out the file. They had to wheel it out on a cart because it was you know, a couple thousand pages. And it was uh, mystifying and amusing and scary as hell um, and very, very touching at certain points because now we know, I mean, the, the level, think about it, the level of surveillance in, 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 the, in the 1930s when they started following around David Lewis and and, uh, and going to his speeches and collecting clippings and sometimes following him on the street. Um, think about the level of surveillance that we live under now. I mean, I've got so many devices and they're, and, and they're monitoring every single one of them as far as I'm concerned. I don't think there's, that's a perfectly rational response to all of the revelations we've had in the last couple of years. 
So, you know, I feel like the file is richer. It's multimedia now, and there's, because I had moments reading my grandpa's file where I was like, I heard his words, they took notes at his speeches, and there was something lovely about that. I, you know, my grandpa died when I was uh, a very young teenager, and I didn't know him that well. And so I kind of feel like, you know, years after my death, when, when somebody finally, you know, hacks the servers and gets my file, uh, there could be some nice mementos for my family in this stuff. <laughs> so I, I feel a real affinity with the, with the intelligence process, and it's really like a family scrapbook for us. So, yeah, so I make these jokes in a, in a very way. Back to my Alberta bashing. Now, I may well be the latest in a long line of Easterners who descend on Alberta and denigrate your province's fine record. But to be fair, I extracted every factoid I just shared with you, except for the last one, from Public Interest Alberta's own election primer, and I'm going to wave it around like Bill did, a fair and just Alberta for all priorities for change. This is an excellent document. If you haven't read it, I insist that you do. In fact, I'm tempted to just take a reading break and like we could all spend 15 or 20 minutes. Um, its recommendations, in my view, amount to nothing less than a roadmap to restoring decency to Alberta's public sphere. The, uh, it's a positive vision of public reinvestment rather than just opposition to cuts. It calls for restoring government revenues in ways that are sensible and moderate and pragmatic and entirely in keeping with what most Albertans believe. In short, I think the proposals in the pages of this document are absolutely fabulous. And I also believe that while necessary, they are entirely insufficient. The document is perfectly pitched, you know, for an election campaign, the art of the possible, and all of that. But I believe that the recommendations only scratch the surface of the transformation that this province is capable of. The transformation that you people in the room can drive if you can find the audacity and the passion and the ambition that matches the true turning point that we find ourselves in. And I'm not talking about the turning point that Jim Prentice talks about. <laughs> I'm talking about the turning point that our planet is telling us about. What I will argue tonight is that Canadians, and particularly Albertans, are living through a once-in-a-generation political moment where all of the elements necessary for truly historic social change are already at hand. If we can recognize them, connect the dots among them, infuse them with our passionate solidarity and incendiary organizing, which I know you do in Alberta. Otherwise, how could you have an organization like Public Interest Alberta in a place like this? I think we could have a game changer of a historical moment on our hands. I really do. I believe this passionately. So this is what I want to do. First, I want to set out for you what I mean by this epic opportunity for progressive change. And second, I want to share with you some observations on how various movements around the world are embracing their own versions of this moment. Particularly, and, and, and I think this is important, you know, despite my excitement around the election, I think it's important in an electoral moment to talk about how to build progressive power outside of the electoral sphere. Because, you know, let's face it, despite my genetic dispensation to flee the podium, grab a clipboard, and start canvassing in this poll right now, Barring an upset of unprecedented proportions, you are going to have another right-wing government in Alberta on May 6th. Ooh. Well, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not here to rain on the, you know, the canvassing energy. Obviously, I'm jealous. You guys get to go out and talk to voters. It's one of the greatest things on earth. But this is, this is the system that you live in. And elections are a fantastic time to work like hell and engage uh, with the electorate and focus on the issues. But they're not so much the source of change Elections are a reflection of it. And so the most critical work is done when the voting is over or before the campaigning begins. So in describing what I think this historic moment calls for, I'll draw on some examples of community struggles and new alliances that I've been witnessing firsthand over the last four or five years as I've been working on this latest, and as Bill mentioned, or should have mentioned, tragically unfinished documentary. Um, in particular, I have a chunk of the film, 10 minutes, that, uh, of a story that we shot in Greece that I want to share with you. First people in the world to see this piece of the film, so uh, exciting for me. Unlike in Calgary last night, the faces of the Greek activists will not be green. 
I'm, I'm, we have reasonable expectation of flesh tones on this. On this <laughs> and then finally, towards the end of, of my remarks, I will bring things back to Alberta and suggest what role I feel you can play here in advocating a radical plan for human survival. In other words, the way we respond to the climate crisis is the way that we can focus all of this pre-existing work that we're engaged in. I, it's a plan, you know, I'm not going to lay out the specifics because they're for you to figure out for Alberta, but I got a few ideas. I think it, can, it could create a gusher of unionized jobs, and I think it could uh, create a tide of government revenue to vastly restore and expand the public sphere, which is what is required at this point in history. Right? Thank you. And then I will answer your questions, speaking faster and faster as we all hear the irresistible cause of retiring upstairs to the bar. So, <laughs> the opportunity. Let, let me just start by uh, explaining to you a, a little bit about the journey that I've been on since my, I left my last actual job in journalism in 2010 and made the decision to embrace the perpetual fundraising, self-doubt, and creative uh, apocalypse that is documentary filmmaking. Uh, the product, project that I've been working on for these years is called, it has a very modest title, as Bill said, it's called This Changes Everything, and it has certainly changed everything for me. Uh, but then I've gotten used to that happening rhythmically every five to seven years. It's one of the many joys of being married to Naomi Klein. Uh, Naomi and I planned this book and film as parallel projects. Um, though it is sobering that she was able to complete one of her door-stopping blockbusters a full year earlier than I could complete the documentary. <laughs> Obviously, you know, I've got some stuff to work out here. Just give, just give me a chance. <laughs> this is therapy for me, too. Um, and uh, though we have been collaborating for many years, and in a way this project is sort of uh, a result of a 20-year of a conversation that, that she and I have been having, the ideas and the, and the framings at the heart of this project are, are largely Naomi. So, if anything sounds familiar tonight, or, uh, or if you think that I'm having a burst of elegant and original insight, you can be sure that it's because I'm channeling my wife. <laughs> um, and on the other hand, if there are any factual errors, uh, juvenile outbursts, uh, slander, swearing, or other inappropriate behavior, obviously that's me. So, the this in This Changes Everything is not the book or the film or anything that we do or say. What changes everything is climate change. And the faster we recognize that, the sooner we can break free of our everyday denial and avoidance and get to the work of building the world that this crisis demands. A more just and stable world, a saner system. The root of the climate crisis is an economic system that pretends you can have infinite growth on a finite planet. It's just not that complicated. You can't. And everything about our economic system is predicated on extracting more and more and more and on indiscriminate growth at any cost. So when you realize that, when you realize that the same economic logic that is producing runaway greenhouse gas emissions and global warming is also producing inequality and austerity and injustice that we've been fighting for decades, you start to realize that maybe the response to both crises could be the same set of ideas and policies. And so that's really the, that's the core of the opportunity that I think we have globally. But first, you know, in the sort of public service, let's all uh, join hands and be scared for a minute. Let us look at the climate piece of it briefly and remember what we're actually talking about. Why does climate change change everything? You know, we see the latest study about the melting glaciers. It's very serious. You saw that study this week. It was front page news all over Alberta. The western glaciers are melting faster than we thought. And the way it's reported, in 70 years... Okay, I've stopped reading. This far away problem. Okay, not far away. I came here a couple of years ago to shoot in the tar sands, and I actually had some interviews lined up with oil executives, and they had to be canceled at the last second because their buildings were, their lobbies were underwater, and their, the lights were out in downtown Calgary. I mean, you, you're seeing it in this province. The water is running out. Southern Alberta, thanks to you know unique combinations of market mechanisms and trading water licenses, and now selling them off for development, you're going to be facing California-like drought here if you don't actually start taking care of your water. These are not future problems; they're present problems. Um, but they come from, and, and there's been an epic failure to deal with them. We've been negotiating 
as a species, reducing greenhouse gas emissions since the year NAFTA was signed. Bill Clinton was elected president, and I'm too sexy for my shirt. Was playing on the radio. <laughs> you remember that? You, you remember that? Very good. Uh, and since the global, global climate uh, negotiations started in 1992, what has happened? Global emissions have increased by more than 60%. And despite increased disasters and increasingly shocking scientific warnings, global emissions continue to rise year after year after year. We are hurtling in the wrong direction. <coughs> and so we face a massive procrastination penalty. Because in the same period, climate science has established a carbon budget for Earth. These are things we can measure. A set amount of carbon that we can release into the atmosphere and still give ourselves a decent chance of avoiding a catastrophic future. And that budget is now incredibly small. And so if we're going to get emissions under control, and if you, if you read uh, and pay attention to the cutting edge climate scientists like Kevin Anderson uh, and Alice Bose Larkin at the Tyndall Center in Manchester in the UK, and others who are not just honest about the science that they're doing, but help us understand the implications of the science. Uh, if you listen to those climate scientists, they're telling us that we have to, in rich countries like Canada and many other countries, we've got to start cutting emissions like 10% a year, year after year, starting freaking yesterday. So had we gotten serious about reducing emissions in 1992, we probably could have done it incrementally, and we didn't. So reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 10% year, year after year after year, is not compatible with our current economic system. It just can't be done. It's never been done. There's no, this green growth thing, as far as I'm concerned, is a, is a canon. This is, we're talking about radical change that is required. So, as the, uh, as the American uh, senators like to say, I'm not a climate expert, so, you know, why listen to me? I mean, I've been reading reports, and I've been following the subject. I've given my few year, a few years of my life to following it. But why believe me, a known subversive with a well-documented ideological agenda? <laughs> These questions have to be asked. In the past year or two, institutions like the World Bank and the International Energy Agency and PricewaterhouseCoopers, not exactly, you know, members of the socialist knitting circle, have released reports on our current climate trajectory. And they all say about the same thing. Without a dramatic shift in the way we produce and consume energy, our current path leads us straight to four to six degrees of warming over pre-industrial levels. You know, and since the Industrial Revolution, remember, we're only at around 0.8 or you know, less than one degree of warming. And we're already seeing historic flooding and drought and fire and storms and migrations and food emergencies. When they t to try to describe a four to six degree warming world, scientists resort to constructions like incompatible with what we think of as organized society. So, massive change is coming one way or another. If we want to see what that terrifying future looks like, all we have to do is nothing. Take the kids to school. Canvas your poll in the election. Take out the recycling. Fun stuff, right? This is, what, this is what it's like when you stop looking away from climate change and you embrace. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're literate people. We went through the Alberta educational system when it was like it is today. We had vibrant teachers and we can read <laughs> reports. And when we make ourselves look, uh, this is what we face. I avoided climate change for years. I, I, I still, as a person making a, a climate change documentary for the past almost five years, I still look at the, at, the, at the news some days and go like, I can't do it, I just can't. I can't read that story. I don't want to go there. But this is what's happening. So if we want to avoid that future, we have to embrace radical change to our economic, social, and political system. And that, I submit to you, with all the passion I can muster, could be very good news indeed. Who knows it better than Albertans? <clears throat> Here you are, in the very heart of the global carbon economy, watching raging torrents of wealth leave your province year after year, 
decade after decade, flooding into the coffers of the richest industry in history, leaving behind waiting lists for surgery, crumbling public infrastructure, 143,000 children living in poverty, more than 170 square kilometers of toxic lakes, and a $7 billion budget hole. Like, people in this province know that the system is broken. Right? So this is a huge opportunity for progressives who have, been already, who have already been working for these kinds of social justice-based changes uh, for decades. But this is what's been so exciting for me about embracing this terrifying subject. The climate lens brings our struggles into sharp focus. When we harness the urgency and the scientific basis of the climate crisis in the way we do our work, in the way we organize, we have an explosive <clears throat> possibility. And that's the backdrop to this historic moment. We know it's change or be changed. So here's the next piece. I'll, 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 I'll settle into some a little bit more detail now. This next one is just a gift. This has just been handed to us by the very system that we seek to change. This is, uh, this is a fact that on the surface, even the Alberta PCs understand. Your finance minister has said this repeatedly in recent days. Hell, Jim Prentice said it when he dropped the writ. We've heard conservatives in this province for years, possibly decades. We have to get off the roller coaster. We have to get off oil. Finally, something I agree with the Alberta PCs on. I know what you're thinking, and you're completely right. They don't mean what I mean when I say that. In fact, we know they don't even really mean it at all. They just say it because they know that the majority of people in this province know that a boom and bust economy leaves nothing but waste and pollution and a ravaged public sphere behind. And of course, Prentice and Campbell and the guys are just saying that this province needs to get off oil revenue. I'm saying, science is saying, that our society needs to get off fossil fuels. Period. But this particular moment, when even the guys steering this ship into the iceberg are saying it, uh, gives us a special opportunity uh, to make their fake words mean the real thing. When oil prices plunge 50% in a matter of months, it is indeed a shock. I agree. It's a price shock. It is a shock. And throughout history, great shocks have often led to great shifts, and usually for the worse. But not always. Not always. I think in the same way that the crash of 1929 and World War II opened the door to the regulation of banks and the building of the welfare state, this price shock could be harnessed to advance the vision of a new economy and a new energy system beyond fossil fuels. And that's a job we have to do. You know, there's something else about this moment in Alberta that I'm sure you've noticed. I mean, if I've noticed it in a couple of days, you must have noticed it recently. The industry has temporarily lost its swagger. <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of great. You know, it's a little more difficult to cast yourself as the great engine of the global economy when you're laying off tens of thousands of workers around the world. And in the harsh light of the price crash, something else is illuminated. The servants of industry. Those Tory politicians in both Edmonton and Ottawa stand exposed as the fossils that they are. Come on. <laughs> mindlessly gambling not only our provincial and national finances, but our very future on the same old dirty and volatile forms of energy. And it's not just the industry and its political pawns that have been captured and compromised by the boom times. And I think a lot of Albertans recognize this. We're all on this roller coaster together. And to the extent that the Canadian economy has been systematically harnessed to the interests of the oil industry under Stephen Harper, we are nationally all on this roller coaster together. But you know, you guys are at the you guys are on the fence line, as they say. So you know, when 19-year-olds can make $300,000 a year, it warps the culture uh, of a whole society. And uh, I know there are a couple of 19-year-olds uh, in the audience tonight. Nothing personal. Uh, you don't want to make $300,000 a year when you're 19. It's a disaster. Uh, <laughs> okay, everyone makes wants to make $300,000 a year. Um, but I've spent time in the bars and the camps of, of Fort Mac. And I've met many perfectly lovely and decent young men 
okay, not all of them lovely, but, 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 but all of them decent, whose behavior merely reflects the insanity of the boomtown culture around them. What are you going to do with that kind of money when you're, when, when, when you're that age? You're going to buy, you know, skidoos and trucks and, and, and just revel in the, in, in the craziness. So Albertans know the collective delusion and the decadence of the high times. You've been through it before. It's hard to get anyone to listen to sense in those periods. You know this. But it's a hell of a lot easier right now at 50 bucks a barrel. So we've got to make use of this moment. Not just kick back and enjoy it be, you know, a little bit smug. We have to make use of this one. So I submit to you tonight, it is time to truly kick oil while it's down. Yes. The price, I mean, I'm just saying. It is an epochal opportunity. And there's more. Any, you know, forgive me a little bit of geekery here. I keep telling Naomi to include this point and she won't. Because I'm excited about low interest rates and public infrastructure. Bear with me. Right? We have two gifts from our economic system at the same time right now. Low, low oil prices and, and, and historic low interest rates. Which means that public sector borrowing for public infrastructure projects has never been cheaper. Even Jim Prentice knows this. Which is why infrastructure is about the only thing that he's not cutting in this province. Right? But let's apply the climate test. Let's, let's keep the climate lens on what we advocate on what we're fighting for. What infrastructure should we be investing in right now? Or more pointedly, why on earth would we build out the fossil fuel economy at this point in history? So I'm going to continue to push the envelope. Bill asked me to, so I'm happy to do that. I'm going to continue to challenge you here tonight. And I do it with sincere respect and, frankly, love for public interest Alberta. And why not every single one of you individually? Um, <laughs> But I think the Alberta Federation of Labor should go back to the drawing board on calling for more public money to build new oil refineries in this province. I mean, I'm, I'm all for value added, okay? But what value is there in adding to the stock of the very infrastructure that we need urgently to retire? I think it's a terrible idea. If we're going to make a U-turn on emissions, if we're going to have a science-based response to the climate crisis, we absolutely cannot lock in more 50-year infrastructure for the industry that is imperiling the planet. It's just crazy. It can't be done. We can't do it. So, does that mean like I'm suddenly against public infrastructure spending? Hell no! We need repairs and new buildings for schools and hospitals and arts and community centers. We need 21st century electricity grids. We need energy saving retrofits. We need public transit investments on a scale that would make the oil industry blush. We need unprecedented public spending to roll out renewable energy of all kinds in a breathtakingly rapid and ambitious fashion. So yes, we do need public infrastructure spending, and the conditions have never been better. It needs to be the infrastructure that is part of a grand transition. And by the way, when I talk about renewable energy tonight, I don't mean gas, nuclear, or the thinly veiled oil industry subsidy known as carbon capture and storage. But before I get excited about those things and digress yet again, let's leave that for the Q&A. I am just getting started here. Now, by the way, uh, having taken a shot at the AFL and one of, of the organization's many positions, let me say something else that I feel very strongly about about the AFL. Give me a chance. <laughs> you know the Better Way Alberta campaign? It's fantastic! It's disgusting that it's been ruled for party election advertising. It's wrong. It's basic public education about the scam and the shame of the way the PCs have gutted government revenue in Alberta, and it should be required viewing by every voter in this province, not taken off by the media post. I'm very glad we agree about that. <laughs> All right, to return to my principal rant. So, we have the implications of the climate crisis climate crisis creating a clarion mandate for transformative change. We have a window of opportunity opened by low oil prices and low interest rates and a general recognition in Alberta that it's time to get off oil and really get off it if we take the argument to its logical conclusion. So there are two more elements of the opportunity that I want to touch on. This great transition can also build on a global weariness with austerity 
and on the flip side, a simultaneous hunger, deep hunger, for a positive direction for society. So first, the austerity trap. Since 2008, we have all been paying for the institutionalized insanity of financial speculation. When the banks were bailed out, remember it's not that long ago, when the banks were bailed out to the tune of trillions without any requirement that they change their 1% ways, even by 1%, the jig was up for most people around the world. The system stood naked in the eyes of the world, in its shamelessness, in its love of inequality. And since then, the same players who almost crashed the global economy, if we hadn't saved them, have been rewarded, while the vast majority of actual hardworking people around the world have paid a terrible price. Now, Canada dodged some of it, not all of it. Um, but even in a privileged country like ours, in the, the aftermath of 2008, uh, has been deeply and darkly dramatic. It goes beyond the stealth austerity of the Harper government with its relentless and effective campaign to shrink the role of government incrementally. Which I should, I'd love to give a whole speech on sometime. Look at the cynical sh sale of the auto shares that the, that the government of Canada bought at the height of the crisis that happened last week where we're, we're on the hook for billions of dollars so that they can ba balance their, their, their budget this time around. I mean, that's just irresponsible. It should be criminal. This weariness with austerity and, 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 it's, and, and, the, and the teeth that, it, that, it, that, it's, that it's sunk into, in, in, into the society goes beyond the short-sighted squandering of the last oil boom here in Alberta that the PCs presided over and the $7 billion hole in the richest piece of the Canadian fabric. Our whole economy is on a dangerous trajectory. Just consider this, I just plucked this thing, jumped out of the newspaper at me uh, last week, I want to share it with you. One juxtaposition, courtesy of StatScan and CIBC World Markets. Uh, one institution beleaguered, the other seems to be doing well. Canadian wages have not recovered since 2008. Job quality in Canada <coughs> is at a record low. And in January, the Canadian economy actually shrank. And at exactly the same time, Canadian corporate profits are at a 27-year high, and according to the CIBC economist quoted in the story, quote, by all measures, higher corporate profit margins are here to stay. Mm -hmm. Now, you're not surprised, and that is precisely my point. After 35 years of privatization and deregulation and austerity and corporate triumphalism, there is a wider and deeper recognition of the injustice of our economic system than we have seen in the world since the 1930s. This is a fertile landscape for transformative change. And so the flip side of this weariness and discontent uh, is a hunger for something better. And we need to seize and take advantage of this inspiration gap, a craving among people across the political spectrum for a positive vision. And I don't mean just like happy talk where politicians seem happy all the time. <laughs> I mean a bold, ambitious vision about how we regain our sense of the collective, a common purpose, a shared feeling across society that we're going somewhere, like other than slowly down the drain, or not so slowly. I've spent the last 25 years as a journalist talking to people at every level of society, you know, from peasant farmers to CEOs in countries around the world, and I personally have never seen such an appetite for radical and progressive solutions as I see today. And that counts here in Alberta just as much. So, a great economic and energy transition away from fossil fuels, away from endless extraction, away from an economy driven by endless consumption, and towards a restored public sphere, a sane and stable economy and environment. This grand transition idea, I think, answers the political moment perfectly. Here's the thing. Our politicians, with the exception of the ones in this room, obviously, don't have the courage or the vision to articulate it. Our utterly disappointing and predictable media class, and I speak as one of them, uh, too busy live blogging, tweeting, and shooting video in between filing stories to even think on this, uh, on this scale. And, and if we're honest, if we're really honest, even we, as defenders of the public sphere, are spending too much time, and have always spent too much time, fighting rearguard actions to hang on to what we've got, which is less and less as time goes on. 
But I believe passionately that now is the time not to retreat, but to move the goalposts, to get way more ambitious, and to embrace a vision of sweeping change, one that responds to the clear message of the science and the already unfolding crisis of the climate. And while this spirit has maybe not entered the mainstream yet, um, my research and travels of the last five years working on this film have convinced me that it's growing. And where it's growing is at the grassroots. Where it's growing is in social movements. And we are seeing, if we weed it out, through, from, out from all the bad news, we are seeing an extraordinary surge of activism and organizing in this country and around the world. We're seeing it particularly among indigenous struggles. Um, and here in Alberta, from the north, from the Lubicon Cree, from the Beaver Lake Cree Nation, you have, and from many other First Nations, from the Athabasca uh, Chippewan, you have some of the most powerful indigenous leaders in a generation. And they are getting around the world and telling their stories. And they are building new alliances with other movements, and it is extremely exciting. We're seeing a surge of activism and organizing in local struggles against extraction projects all around the world. And we're seeing this extraordinary explosive growth of the global climate justice movement more broadly. But we're also seeing amazing social movement momentum in movements against evictions, against poverty, against austerity in the United States, the, the $15 wage movement in, in Europe, the movements against austerity. And what we're starting to see, which is actually the most exciting thing that really could change the equation, is a spirit of connecting the dots. And this is the work that I'm really engaged in now as I try to wrap up this film and as Naomi is, is going around the world and, and, and launching the book, is trying to use this analysis to help people connect the dots among struggles. Like our great remaining enemy is silos. <laughs> it's kind of NGO speak, but it's like the idea that we all have our separate struggles and that, you know, solidarity brother or sister, except when it's really cold outside and you're having a rally and it's not my issue, right? Like, this is what we need to break. We need to shatter uh, that keeping to our own issue. And I, think, and I think the contribution that we're trying to make is to show that it is part of the same issue. And there is an issue that unites the others. Not that everyone should become climate activists. I would, I, if, if, if that was the message that people took from this, from this, from this evening, I would be devastated. It's that you have to double down and win your struggles because the climate requires all of these progressive struggles to be won. So, in these movements, which I've been, you know, trying to document, we're also seeing an openness to an alternative worldview. We're seeing, you know, like there's something called the degrowth movement, uh, which is which is not taking root in North America. Uh, as much as it has in Europe, which is basically, I mean, it's a kind of an academic movement, but it's about questioning the primacy of growth, right? Like a forest fire contributes to the economy. What? Right, we know this stuff, right? GDP is a terrible measure of the progress of a society. And now it's great, even the ruling class is saying it, and then we read it in the newspaper, but it doesn't change the way our economy works. So there are people who are saying we have to knock growth, indiscriminate growth at any cost, off the, uh, off the pedestal. Uh, as the measure of, of, of how our society is doing. Um, and, and that movement is growing fast. It's about a worldview that values well-being more than just being well off. That recognizes that we are slamming up against very hard limits in the natural world. And that we need a system that celebrates living within limits. And, and, and I think the message of climate change, climate change is a message that's telling us we're reaching limits. And the great thing is, when we actually look at the consumer-driven capitalism that we live in today, consumption, hyper-consumption was not always the basis of all economic activity. The global economy has been reconfigured in this period of globalization in the last 20, 30 years to put consumption as, as the driver of all economic growth and prosperity. It wasn't even like that in the 70s. Uh, and I'm not saying we should just go back to the 70s, because I think the 70s are not, that that's, can't be the goal. <laughs> we need something way better. Now, it's some of the music, okay. But, but, uh, but the notion that, that living within limits 
is actually a more restful, more inspiring, more connected, more meaningful way to live. It's something that is incredibly attractive. Just, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I have a pretty low uh, threshold for flakiness of all kinds. But being someone who lives in Toronto, obviously I've done some yoga in the last few years. And, and you know, come on. All right, who, who here hasn't? So the, so what, my, what, my, yeah, there, there is a guy over here. Two, okay. Both wearing baseball caps. Don't worry, we hang on to our own cultural signifiers and that's, that's, that's great. No, what I'm saying is, there is obviously a hunger in society, you know, like, the fact that you can go to a camp in Fort Mac and if someone is talking about wellness, and they might get teased, but everyone knows what they mean. <laughs> right? Or mindfulness. We have, as a society, a hunger for a different set of values by which to live. And the notion of consumption and consumption and consumption is reaching the end of its appeal. Um, and that is, we're really seeing that in emerging social movements today. So, you know, rather than blather on you about really abstract and high-minded things forever, I would like to share maybe one specific example, and I'll get into a couple of others. But I want to share this clip from the film now. Um, it's, it takes place in Greece, in a rather conservative uh, region in the north of Greece called Chalkidiki, where it's basically like a farming and fishing and, and tourism economy. Uh, this story takes place against the uh, backdrop of the horrific austerity that's been imposed on Greece and the Greek people since 2008. Um, in my view, the countries of southern Europe are essentially being turned into export colonies, um, pushed into the dirtiest and dangerous kinds of economic development by the, by the powers of, the, of northern Europe like Greece and uh, like uh, Germany and France. It is being done through the mechanism of debt, the way they always do it to it, just like they're doing it to you in Alberta right now. We have to cut things because of the deficit that we created through our own corporate-friendly policies, but it's always the debt that's held over our heads. Um, in Europe, of course, it's odious debt because it's debt that was passed on to those people by the bank bailouts and by the corrupt politicians who have managed this uh, latest crisis of capitalism. And this struggle in, in this beautiful area in northern Greece stars some unlikely heroes. Um, these are working people who were anything but activist uh, until they were radicalized by their situation. So this is about a 10 minute clip, settle in, have a quick nap, uh, <laughs> if, 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 I, I won't be offended. Um, if you like it, terrific. I'll be pacing nervously at the side, and then, uh, and then I'll come back and we'll talk about other stuff after. We're just gonna kill the lights. Will that get on the video? and the worldview that is threatening our planet, right? As soon as the economy gets into trouble, and of course we know who created the problems, it's like, sell off anything you've got, right? Take whatever you can and leave a desert behind. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> and it also shows communities who are rejecting that logic. They're not just fighting against this mind. They're rejecting the whole world view. It's a model of how a local struggle can be a gateway drug to, to a vision of wholesale social change. And I, think, and I think that's the kind of model that we need to work with. And, you know, they're not just trying to keep this out of their backyard. They're fighting to protect the land, and they're starting to recognize that the fight to protect the land and the fight to protect the public is the same fight. And so, for this reason, the battle of Haukidiki gets, for me, gets at one of the biggest barriers that we face in this historic moment, which is the old jobs versus the environment lie. And we gotta talk about it, because it's like right there. And we're all immersed in it. We've all absorbed this lie at the cellular level, and it's in us too, like, so let's, let's talk about it. It works every time. I believe this is nothing more than a tactic to divide us. This thing of pitting jobs against the environment only makes sense if you're trapped inside the logic of our broken system. I'll tell you what I mean. If the only vision of prosperity for Greece comes from digging big holes in the ground and drilling for oil in the pristine Aegean Sea, like what could possibly go wrong, right? 
then yeah, protecting the environment can be pitted against the few jobs. If the only vision of prosperity for Alberta is tripling tar sands production every 20 years, then yes, environmentalists and workers will continue to see each other as mortal enemies. But as soon as we realize that the real problem is the insatiable need of our system for unending profit and indiscriminate growth at any cost, as soon as we realize that these huge toxic extractive projects are just are nothing more than the most efficient means to centralize wealth and power in the fewest hands, the product of the fossilized imagination of crony capitalism. As soon as we let us, ourselves see the whole model and how bad it is for people and the land, that false dichotomy just disappears. In fact, what's best for the land and what's best for people is the same thing, a reciprocal relationship. An economy based on regeneration, not on endless extraction. Putting the priority of our system on stability, not maximum profit, not boom and bust, but stability, keeping things within a limit. And there's more good news. It turns out, when you connect the dots between fossil fuels and the economic and political systems that they fund and drive and obey, what's best for the earth and its inhabitants is also best for democracy. And I understand that democracy is occasionally seen as something of an issue here in Alberta. Uh, let me just leave it there. Um, I, I want to play you another little clip. Um, because we've ent entered the video portion of tonight's program. Um, this is not for my documentary. In fact, stylistically, it sort of couldn't be more different. It's a five-minute animated PSA, which is actually a genre that usually makes my whole body break out in hives. Um, but I am temporarily suspending my aesthetic snobbery because I am super excited about this little video that I'm going to show you. It landed in my inbox yesterday, literally when I landed in Alberta. Uh, and the timing and the theme just strike me as so on point uh, for, for what we're talking about tonight that I can't resist. This video was produced by a wonderful, fast-growing global alliance called Trade Unions for Energy Democracy. Now, if there are union leaders in this room, you are, and who are... Who did that? Trade Unions for Energy Democracy. Um, this is global? It's a global organization. Um, I know one of, one of the key organizers, his name is Sean Sweeney, and he works, he was at the Cornell Global Labor Center and he just moved to, to another university recently, but he's been working with uh, trade unions around the world um, on getting better climate change approaches within the trade union movement and identifying those unions who really are progressive um, and are prepared to take visionary stands. On, on climate and social justice. And this is something that's been building for years, but all of a sudden, you know, I think the moment is, is really here. So one thing that this little video brings up for me, uh, it brought up for me immediately is so, you know, can we do that here in Canada? Can we do it here in Alberta? Yes. Okay, so first of all, we got a couple of different elements. Can we reach 100% renewables? Can we reach 100% renewables? There's a lot of skepticism with that, okay? Two weeks ago, this report came out. It's called uh, Acting on Climate Change, Solutions from Canadian Scholars. It's a work of more than 70 Canadian scientists, engineers, <coughs> economists, and other scientists. This report, I've read it, it's peer-reviewed, it's meticulously detailed, it is utterly convincing. This report of people, and it's not just like theoreticians, there are engineers involved engaging with the actual technologies. These 70 Canadian scientists say that Canada can reach 100% renewable energy in 20 years years. It is absolutely possible. And don't let anyone tell you that it isn't. And when they tell you it isn't, just check for what interest they might be representing when they say The technology is ready for prime time. The price of solar globally, the price of solar energy globally has been cut in half in the last five years years. Wow. There are many jurisdictions on earth where solar is competitive with coal without any subsidy or any policy support whatsoever. And those policies feed in tariffs, net metering, let's not disappear into the, into the jargon of the alternative energy field, but they're well known. They're field tested. They're ready to deploy. 
The policy levers are there. They're right at hand. They're not complex. As for the community control piece, okay, they're talking about public ownership of the energy industry in Alberta. Okay. Can't be done. It's just we can't take on powers like that. Look at Germany. Look at Germany. Are you guys up with what's going on in Germany? They've got this little thing they've been doing there called the Energiewende, the energy transition. And in a decade, they've boosted the share of renewables in their energy mix to 30% in a decade. But here's the crazy, amazing part of it. In the process, they have created 400,000 jobs. Wow. 900 new energy cooperatives in Germany in the last decades. And they are replacing private power monopolies with community-controlled, non-profit utilities that invest massively in solar and wind and other, and other renewables, and then they keep the profits in the communities to pay for local services. Would that be popular here? <laughs> Norway, Norway. So there is a genuine energy democracy emerging in the most powerful economy in Europe. Now, there's lots of problems with the energy transition in, in Germany. It's kind of like, you know, how much detail do we want to get into? But they are fighting a big battle right now because it's been so successful, the private companies that got, you know, the big power utilities that were like, eh, this will this will play out, but we'll just sit to this. They're losing money hand over fist. The biggest power utilities in Germany are, are, in, a, are in a crisis. So they want to move back in and take over the alternative energy and centralize it and corporatize it. And so they're having to fight this new battle. And they didn't do it totally right because they had the yes, but not the no in this case. We get accused of having the no, but not the yes. In the, the way the German government did it, they, they, they embraced all of the policies that led to this energy revo revolution, and they did a lot of things right, but they didn't have what it took to say no to the coal industry. And so for some years in this energy transition, Germany's emissions actually went up because they weren't actually bringing down coal at the same time as they were bringing up renewables. So now there is a resurgent anti-coal movement in Germany, and they're going, they're really working to phase out coal in Germany, which could be like a really great campaign here in Alberta, phase out coal. Don't you, don't you think? You get so much of your energy for coal, you know, and you have incredible wind potential, the best solar potential in Canada, here in Alberta, and, um, you know, I was, draw I was on, I, I, I just came back from uh, a, a couple of weeks in Europe. I was supporting Naomi when she was launching her book there. And we were on a high-speed train from Madrid to Barcelona. And, I know, tough life. Um, and <laughs> I was a babysitter, come on. Um, and we're speeding through this beautiful landscape, and the train is going like 300 kilometers an hour. Uh, perfectly smooth. And we're just going past windmills and windmills and windmills. And I know people, some people don't like windmills. I think they're gorgeous. And I just felt like I was, I, I, was, I had got, suddenly gotten like a little return trip to the future. And as I was driving from Calgary to Edmonton uh, today with Bill, I was like, why aren't there windmills everywhere? Um, I, I know there are some coming up. And we need about 10 times as fast and about 100 times as many. So, so, so what will it take to replicate this kind of success and improve on its failings if we want to do it here and there? Well, Pro proportional I, representation. That's a big part of it, and we're all starting the question period, and I'm delighted about that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's breaking out already. It's getting to be an interactive session. I, I know I'm leaving pauses that are too long. Um, we, I don't think we're going to see leadership on this issue from, from the political class. Uh, in this province, again, accepting the candidates in this room. And there is some exciting momentum around a little party that I'm personally unfamiliar with, but apparently you're, the new leader, she's fantastic. And, uh, and, and, and that's a little bit exciting in Alberta right now. Maybe that party could be convinced to lead a, a, a charge for a really ambitious, bold, and game-changing climate and energy transition policy in Alberta. I don't know, I haven't looked at their books, but maybe they need a push in the right direction. So. We are, seeing, we are seeing leadership from a, a part of the global trade union movement, like Trade Unions for Democracy. Um, but, but let's be honest. I think the propulsion for, for this transition is going to come from social movements. It's going to come from cross-sectoral alliances of different struggles coming together. 
And you know, if you look at the case in Germany, the Energiewende was really propelled by the country's long-standing and very powerful anti-nuclear movement, as it made common cause with other progressive forces uh, in different communities. And the reason that I spent so much of my time tonight trying to connect dots between environmental and economic causes and effects and systems and organizing is because I think cross-sectoral organizing is the only thing that's going to get us there in time. We are, after all, trying to change everything. And to quote the slogan from the fabulous People's Climate March in New York last September, to change everything, we need everyone. And the way I see it, Climate change doesn't demand that everyone drop what they're doing and run to the climate tent. Like I said before, that would be a total disaster. When we can see the roots of the crisis in the very logic of our economic system, it means the fight for social justice and the fight for climate justice are one and the same fight. And it means that the fight for social justice has the existential urgency and the scientific basis, the fight or flight of being in a real crisis, which we are in, to power us, and it means that we can power us across the progressive spectrum. And that is already beginning to happen. Let's take a look at just some of the things that have emerged in the past few years in the, in the, in the climate movement. Six years ago, Keystone XL was considered such a slam dunk that TransCanada bought the pipe. <laughs> they bought the pipe. They've been storing hundreds of kilometers of pipe at the cost of millions and millions and millions of dollars for all of these years of delay. The North American climate movement has been accelerated massively by this whole web of battles against different pipelines. And this wave crested at the unprecedented People's Climate March. I was, I was lucky enough to be there in the streets with 400,000 other people. And it was unlike any other rally I've ever attended. And you can imagine as an orange type of baby, I've been to a few rallies. <laughs> It was unlike any environmental event that this continent has ever witnessed. It was diverse. It was led by indigenous people. These two fabulous young, two of many fabulous young indigenous leaders from this province, Crystal Lehman from the Beaver Lake Cree Nation, who has spoken at public and just Alberta events, and Melina Levokan Nasimo from the, from the Lubicon Cree, were at the very front of the People's Climate March in front of 400,000 people. Does Alberta Foundations are committing to divesting from dirty energy. It's the fastest growing divestment movement that's ever been seen. The day after the People's Climate March in New York, members of the Rockefeller family and one of their foundations announced their intention to divest from fossil fuels. Just think about that. The heirs of the standard oil fortune declaring that fossil fuels are immoral. Can we do it in Alberta if they can do it? The Rockefellers? Good lord. And, and, I, and, and, and I say that because I know that in oil-saturated Alberta, this kind of exciting climate momentum can seem pretty far away. I know it seems like a hard sell to translate that momentum here. I know that every single person in this room knows somebody, and for many of you, it's family members, who rely on the oil and gas industry to put food on the table. I understand that. And I think that many of the big environmental groups and the environmental movement over the past decades uh, has done a terrible job of really grappling with the implications for workers in polluting industries when, you know, environmentalists campaign against tar sands and coal and other fossil fuels. But at the grassroots, that's changing. <clears throat> I'm going to play you one last clip. I know the night is getting long. This is a two-minute clip. I'm not going to introduce it because it's totally self-explanatory. It's the first two minutes, it's, the, it's two minutes of my, of my first conversation with, a, with an oil sands worker that I met in Lackville Bish uh, a couple of years ago. His name is Liam. He's a proud member of the International Brotherhood of Boiler Makers, which is a very, very pro-coal, pro-oil union. And this is what Liam had to tell me. Albertans to Albertans, that's what I'm here to do. Um, I think Liam is a refreshingly clear thinker. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about starting a little boutique business where I book him at Thanksgiving dinners <laughs> Alberta, uh, next year. In fact, Liam is starting an organization, uh, and he's trying to make a documentary film, I'm helping him, uh, called Iron and Earth, 
which is he's, he wants to build a movement of oil sands workers for a just transition to renewable energy. Wow. And, uh, so I'm, I'm going to wrap things up now. I'm going to do my rousing finale, if you'll, if you'll permit me. Um, but I, 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 you know, Liam's story really highlights for me the extraordinary potential that you have in this province to make a difference on the most critical issue of our time. As citizens who live in the shadow of the largest industrial project on Earth, the most controversial energy source anywhere, you have an exceptional moral advantage when you talk about energy. Dare I say, I think it's the real Alberta advantage. It's like the power that voters have in tiny constituencies where they're like, oh, you know, it's like every one of you is a voter from PEI when you talk on energy issues. For every Albertan that speaks up in favor of a just transition to a renewable economy, we need 150 Ontarians to match the persuasive power. That moral authority that you have, the people in this room right now, students and seniors and union members and union leaders and environmentalists, exceeds anything that exists anywhere else in Canada. I think it's time you collectively took a deep breath and used it. Because here in this one-party state, particularly at election time, couldn't you use a cause that unites all the others and transcends the gridlock sphere of party politics? A movement that addresses the economic deficit, the environmental deficit, and the democracy deficit all at the same time. Just go with me for a second. Imagine a rising Alberta climate justice movement with a radical, transformative vision of making this province a true energy superpower, one that worked in concert with the Earth instead of ripping it up. Yes. Thank you. Imagine, just, just imagine for a second how the national media would flip if you staged a big, loud, radical climate justice rally here in Alberta in the run-up to the global climate talks in Paris at the end of the year. If First Nations, who have been living on the front lines of fossil fuel crimes for generations, were to lead, followed by oil sands workers committed to using their many skills in the service of energy democracy, if healthcare workers who are treating cancer clusters and historic levels of respiratory diseases came together with students who are calling from their for their universities to divest from fossil fuels and also for their governments to invest in post-secondary education, we are on the cusp of historic change it is either going to be inspiring or it is going to be terrifying. And some sectors of this economy are going to have to be managed for dissent. The science is absolutely clear. We cannot burn three quarters, at least three quarters of the fossil fuels that are currently in proven reserves without pushing the earth into catastrophic climate change. That math has been done. So we are going to have to act with compassion and understanding and great warmth towards workers who are being displaced from those industries, but we have to grow the other one just as fast as we wind down what is wrong. Because there are huge parts of our economy and our social fabric that need to grow desperately. The sectors of the economy that have always been low carbon, your sectors, <clears throat> right? The same ones that have been devalued and defunded and disrespected throughout these last decades of triumphant fossil-fueled capitalism. So, yes, solar installation and wind turbine manufacture and all the skilled trades that Liam listed, they can be green jobs. But to really turn this cube, consider all of us who are already green workers, and you can see the movement we need right here in this room. Nursing is a green job. Civil service is a green job. Teaching is a green job. Child and senior care is a green job. Anti-poverty activism is a green job. All of us who are battling for the revival of the commons are already climate warriors. And I just think we have to start acting like it. Thank you. a conference with the title name, Making It Happen. And what better people than this cross-section of amazing leaders and people and activists in this room. 
No, Abby said he didn't want to get between us and our drinks. But, I'll stick to that. And he's going to stick to that. But what we decided we're going to do, and we're going to call this out, we're going to ask for three people to make a comment or a question. And we're specifically asking for young people under the age of, I don't know, younger than me. No, just kidding. <laughs> under the age of 30. <laughs> under the age of 60, you can be later. <laughs> Uh, and uh, gender I'm balance. I'm not as picky about age, but I would, don't want it to be all guys, that's for sure. <laughs> so, three comments, questions, and then Abby's, and then we're going to get to some drinking and relaxing and stuff. Yeah, I'm going to be around tonight, so any, anyone who has a yeah, question or really wants chance, to take a task. We recognize it's gotten later. He was incredibly eloquent and longer than he was in Calgary. <laughs> and it's a better audience. There you go. Anyone? All right, we got we got a hand up over here, Bill. Do we? Yeah. Oh, just wait. You didn't talk a lot about air travel, which is yes. a major, major pollution. Yeah. And I'm in the age group where most of my friends don't think twice about flying somewhere four or five times a year. Mm -hmm. And I'm too uh, reluctant to bring it up to them because who am I to judge? But I think we should be talking about that a lot yeah. more. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's really important. It gets at something that I think is really important. Um, you're absolutely right. Air travel is a huge, uh, a, a huge and growing part of global emissions. But the way you ask your question to me gets at, at, at the heart of how our response has to be shaped. So um, I do too much air travel. I do a lot less than I used to. Um, I feel guilty about it. I still do it. It's part of this work that I'm doing. I'm full of contradictions. So it's a really easy thing for people on the other side to say, well, didn't you take an airplane to get to Alberta? So wait, how can you say, well, how can you talk about climate change? Well, so, so we all live in a capitalist system, so we're not allowed to critique capitalism? Yeah. We are in this system. This is the system. Am I the one who decides the energy sources for the, our economy? We are all compromised. We are all filled with contradictions. We all go shopping when we're scared about money. <laughs> this is who we are. This is the system that has shaped us, okay? So I'm not saying that individual decisions about how we live our lives and trying to be more low carbon uh, isn't important. It is. But that is really characterized, and I think the environmental, Naomi has an extraordinary part in the book where she critiques the environmental approach to climate change for the, for the first sort of three decades. And there's been way too much emphasis on individual activity. So people bike and they recycle and they do everything right and emissions keep going up and up and up because it's not about what individuals do. It's about the systems. It's about regulating the major emitters. It's about dealing with the way our economy requires massive consumption of natural resources and massive emissions of greenhouse gases. So yes, we have to raise this. And, and, and if this is a gateway by which we can engage people to think about their behavior, that's great. But if we're responding as individuals to a collective crisis, we are not going to get there that way. We have to respond collectively. So that's, I mean, I think it's a, it, can, it can be an entrance, but it can't be the only way. Okay. Maybe I have someone back here. Sorry, can we just see your driver's license before okay. checking your Sorry. Okay. Um, hi. 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 Um, so I'm from Australia, but in the spirit of internationalism and solidarity. No, we I'm totally would have got that anyway. <laughs> um, um, I think a lot of the struggles that we have, um, particularly in Australia, are very can draw a lot of parallels to what we have in Canada. We've got a right-wing government, we're a climate criminal, and we're in a crisis of democracy that I think, from what I've been hearing, is very similar to what we have here. About six or seven years ago, they tried to introduce a um, tax on super profits from mining companies in Australia, particularly yeah. Western Australia, which is similar to our Alberta, a very mining-oriented town. And the resulting fatigue, you know, kind of the pandering to job losses and all of it took um, for the whole campaign to come crumbling down and result in a essentially a coup that changed the um, democratically elected leadership this is when in Kevin, Australia. Kevin Rudd, Kevin Rudd yeah. was Gina Reinhardt and the mining companies threatening to withdraw their resources and cripple the economies. Right. And so 
We've got a situation where an unelected super billionaire who made their profit off the backs of the indigenous Australians had the power to destroy the livelihoods of hundreds and over thousands of Australians. And this is a crisis of democracy that I think is reflected in Alberta today. So, and, I think, and I think that that is translated, I'm a student and I'm studying healthcare, and at the moment Australia is trying to shift to a system of privatised, deregulated education like we see in the US. That always so works. It always works. In the exact yeah. wrong direction. Yeah. So we have, like, it's become an election issue. The vast majority of Australian, um, of Australian students and workers and just the population is against privatised education. The vast majority of Australians were against, you know, the kind of power, the economic power that small super billionaires have to cripple their lives and their kind of lives and the status of the Australian economy. So I think, and I mean that's reflected in you know healthcare as well. The amount of like, when nurses go on strike to defend patient ratios, this is not an isolated instance for you know the minority of people who might be nurses. This is an issue for public safety, for the healthcare of the entire population. You're, you're going to do well at this gathering. So, <laughs> and it's an issue that is reflected in the like vacuum of democracy that allows these minor few to override the wishes, the healthcare, the safety, the well-being of the majority of Canadians and Australians. So I think the fact that this kind of presentation is being taken up with trade unionists, with um, workers, is the best thing that could possibly happen and I hope it grows beyond the environment, beyond anything else, to really reflect and incorporate all the struggles. Because I, the thing that you said about it being the same fight is just music to my ears. I think it's a similar situation Thank to everyone else in the room. Thank you. Wow! And we're so glad that we've got people coming all the way from Australia for our conference. The next Prime Minister of Australia, everyone. Excellent. That was lovely. Thank you so much. All right. We're going to go to the last questions and we got going to a high school student. Right on. Disclaimer, I graduated, but I'm, I'm here. Take for my fact. Okay, so. Hi there. Yeah. Uh, really quickly, because yeah. I know youth are really enthusiastic about making change and really enthusiastic to actually go about it. But what it comes down to is how can we empower youth? to make these changes? How can we organize youth to make these changes? That, that's something that, me, myself, I'm actually having trouble is doing. Right. I, I have a talk with the ball on Saturday, it's not going to be fun. But, like, how, how can we, like, how can we empower youth to do what, like, all you guys are doing, like, right? right? Well, well, so I think this is a, that's a great question, and I think there's some significant opportunities for youth organizing that actually don't exist in other parts of the population. Um, after my talk in Calgary last night, a, a fellow came up to me and said, you know, I'm the Green Party candidate and it's riding in Calgary, and if I get, when I go to the door and I say, you know, I'm from the Green Party and I want to talk about climate change, it's like... <sighs> right? I don't think that climate change is like a winning issue at the doorstep, right? We, we, we know that, especially in this province, there's a, there's a, there, you don't ins excite people with the words climate change, except young people. Among young people, climate change is the defining issue of their time. Among young people, climate change is a winner, right? So I actually think the strategy for the rest of us is we have to make this a jobs revolution. We need to make this a justice revolution. And we will explain how climate change is part of that. Leading with climate change doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me strategically, but it's got to be there in everything we do. It's got to be the lens. It is our job to make climate change a winning issue. But among young people, you don't have to fight that. You know, like you, what I think what you need to do with young people is just guard very carefully against this individualist model of change. Because, you know, like they teach recycling in school, and then all the kids go really get into recycling, and then they become the recycling police in the house. And it's like, you put it in the wrong bin! And, you know, like all of these things can be springboards, right? So I think that the, the appetite for climate change among young people, you know, various generations went through it. There are generations of people in this room for whom nuclear war was a, you know, people who remember being taught how to hide under their desks. 
You know, that's a real thing. Now, what did that turn into? Did it turn? Was it just a fearful generation? Because some people became anti-nuclear activists because of that, and then some people in Germany, because they were anti-nuclear activists for 25 years, when the Fukushima disaster happened, they used that quirk, that shock to actually accelerate the country's transition to renewable energy and energy democracy and community control of resources and energy. So this is a lifelong process. And, the, and, the, and I think the key is to get on the right track and not to do what our culture teaches us and internalize everything, but actually see that it's the, it's the collective responses, that it's the connections among people. But I think among young people, it's pretty exciting. So you have these kind of depoliticized climate movements <coughs> among youth, which is like, climate, climate, yay, let's put on our polar bear costume, and like, I'm not against that, like it's, it, it, it can be a starting place, but like that's a right place to make connections. But where does climate change come from? And how do we actually confront it on a systemic level? And I think young people are way smarter and more sophisticated than we give them credit for generally, and, and that kind of analysis, we can sneak it in there with, in the recycling box. So, um, <laughs> you have a great speech next week, or whenever it is. You're, you'll get your class. Shall we retire to the bar? Yeah. yeah. Bill has one more thing left to say. I think I have one very important duty. It's here. Abby talked about uh, digging up, you know, Alberta's dirt and everything and turning it into gold. We talked about it in the film. Uh, those of you who've come to our conferences know that we always give uh, gifts uh -oh. of our, uh, to our speakers uh, that is a bit of Alberta dirt <laughs> turned into beautiful art and sold through the Craft Council. And so we have a, a gift to thank Abby oh, thank and mostly a, a round of applause. Thank you. Upstairs in the St. Michael's room, there's snacks, there's a cash bar, and Abby, and all your friends.